How do you feel about crickets? Do they keep you awake at night? Make your house feel infested? I live outside of town, and a little bit of land, and this time of year, I have crickets everywhere, and their loud chirping at night can make it hard to fall back asleep. And finding little cricket carcasses that the cats leave around the house can also be off-putting. It turns out, though, the humble cricket has quite the relationship history with humanity, from ancient times to today. In this episode, we're going to take a look at some lore and legends, from the past, present, and future surrounding this little wonder bug. And we'll start with a story that is set in ancient China. A long time ago, during the Ming Dynasty, cricket fighting became a very popular sport amongst the noble and wealthy men. And each year, the population had to collect a quota of crickets for the noble courts. One year, the magistrate of an area within central China wanted to gain favor with the higher nobility. So, he set his mind to finding the best fighting cricket he could. He eventually succeeded, and the cricket he presented to the royals became the best fighter. As a result, the royal courts declared his land would become the official royal supplier of crickets. There was only one problem. Crickets were not common in his area and were extremely hard to find. So, the magistrate kicked this responsibility down to his subordinates. One of these subordinates, a neighborhood chief, was named Bu Chang, and he was extraordinarily average. And despite his best efforts to move up the ranks for his own family, he was always outsmarted, neglected, and passed over. In his role as neighborhood head, he was ultimately responsible for collecting taxes, and if he came up short, he would have to pay the rest out of his own pockets. Similarly, he would be responsible for the cricket quota in his nearly cricketless area. There was another problem, too. Crickets were treasured. So, people tended to keep the few crickets that they could find for their own protection and good luck. Bu Chang could not bring himself to take them from the people in his neighborhood to pass up to the royal court. So he set out to find wild ones for himself. He looked everywhere, even the cracks in the walls and the rocks in the gardens, but he only found a few small, weak crickets. When he failed to meet the quota, he was beaten severely by the magistrate's men, so severely he could do nothing but lie down for days afterwards. With his spirit broken, he just wanted to die. Seeing her husband despair, Bu Cheng's wife became very worried, so she set off to see a prominent fortune teller to see if the future was going to be any better. When she arrived, there was a crowd vying for the attention of the old hunchbacked fortune teller. The fortune teller was standing and chanting in the midst of incense smoke before a reverent crowd, bowing deep before her and leaving money on her table. Every so often, a slip of paper would appear out of a curtain behind the fortune teller and contain the fortune of one in the crowd. Bu Chang's wife placed her money at the teller's table and bowed low and in time, received her fortune. Her slip of paper had a picture of a weathered and abandoned shrine amongst a bunch of jagged rocks, and near the shrine was a magnificent green cricket, and next to it, a leaping frog. She hurried home and showed the mysterious fortune to her husband. Bu Chang sat up and got excited. I think I know this shrine, he said. This fortune is telling me where I will find the perfect cricket. So he got up, still aching from his beating, and set off for the old abandoned shrine. When he arrived, he looked carefully in every crack and crevice, prodding with a bamboo staff, but not seeming to find any crickets. So he was beginning to again despair, until suddenly a frog leapt out of nowhere. Recalling the frog from the fortune, he quickly followed after it into the weeds. He followed the frog, and when he reached down to look for it in the weeds, he saw the magnificent green cricket on the fortune with wings that appeared to be made of gold. He caught the cricket and happily took it home. The family was overjoyed with such a fine specimen in their house. Bu Chang put it in a large cage, fed it grain and guarded it, saving it for the next quota that he would have to meet. One night though, his young son crept into the room with the cricket and removed it from the cage. 
As he admired the cricket in his hands, it suddenly jumped away. He frantically chased it around the room and outside. Desperate to recover his family's best hope for the future, he finally caught it. But he had been too rough. One of the cricket's legs was torn off, and its belly was crushed. It twitched for a moment and died. The boy's mother caught him in the moment. Furious, she yelled at him, and told him that he would be in for a world of hurt when his father found out. The boy burst into tears, and his mother went to wake his father. When Bu Chang found out, he was indeed furious. He intended to punish his son as severely as he had been beaten for the missing cricket quota. But when he arrived at the spot with the dead cricket, his son was gone. Furiously, he looked all over. But when he began to run out of places to look, his anger faded and was replaced by worry. He eventually found his son, who had fallen into an old well, and he appeared lifeless. His anger and worry now faded to despair. He pulled his son up from the well and wept. But he soon felt that his son was still breathing, though just barely. So he took him home. But Bu Chang couldn't sleep. He laid awake all night, worried for his son, who was in an unshakable, deep sleep. As morning got closer, he heard a faint chirp outside, and then it grew louder. He sprang into action and went searching for the cricket. He saw it, a large green cricket, like the one before. So he chased after it, and he thought that he'd caught it, but he couldn't feel it in his hands. So he opened his hands to look, and it was there. But in that brief moment, it jumped away and seemed to get faster and faster until he lost track of it and it disappeared entirely. Defeated once again, he just wanted to die. But on the wall next to him, he spotted another cricket. This one black and red and holding very still, but it was very small. Ignoring the small cricket, he began to look in the surrounding area for more crickets. But the black cricket jumped into his shirt. Better than nothing, he decided to take it home. As the quota day approached, Bu Chang had the idea that he would test this cricket in a local fight before presenting it to the royals. I'm screwed either way, he thought. I might as well have some fun with this small cricket until then. So he took it to the fights, and at the sight of the small cricket, a young hotshot with an impressive cricket of his own laughed and placed his large champion cricket in the arena next to it. Bu Chang's cricket just sat there though in a pose that seemed aggressive and ready to fight. But as the larger cricket moved towards it, it remained still. So Bu Chang prodded his small cricket with a piece of grass, but he still didn't have any luck, and he anticipated a loss. But just before the large cricket could bite, the black cricket leapt into action and latched onto the larger cricket's throat. Terrified of losing his prized cricket, the young owner quickly pulled them apart. But as Bu Chang was admiring his small cricket, a rooster that was in the building had taken notice. It came down and it pecked at the cricket, but it missed, and the cricket hopped away. And then the rooster chased the cricket. Now terrified for his cricket, Bu Chang chased after the rooster, only to find that his cricket had latched its jaws onto the rooster's comb and the rooster was attempting to escape from the cricket. Bu Chang quickly took this cricket to the magistrate, who had had him beaten, and presented it. The magistrate could not believe such a small cricket was any good, so he had it fight his own crickets. One by one, Bu Chang's cricket dominated them all, and even bested one of the magistrate's roosters, proving Bu Chang's story. The magistrate took the cricket to the royal palace, where it quickly became the most prized cricket, besting all of the competition. The emperor himself rewarded the magistrate, who in turn made Bu Chang into a nobleman, granted him vast swaths of farmland, several herds of livestock, and the finest goods available. After all of this, Bu Chang's son awoke from his deep sleep and told his father that while he slept, he dreamt that he was a fighting cricket, light and fast, who could best any competition. There are several variants of this basic story, which is generally called the fighting cricket. I paraphrased this one a little bit to clean it up and update some of the language, but it comes from a book called Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Song Ling Pu and translated to English by Herbert Giles, published in 1880. 
find it by clicking the link in the episode description. But I picked this story because it brings up a few themes related to cricket mythology or beliefs, and, of course, the very weird world of cricket fighting, which still happens in a big, organized way today. So, why are, or were, the crickets so treasured? Well, you know that chirping sound that comes to dominate the night? In old China, it was actually considered musical, soothing, and entertaining. Male crickets are the ones that chirp, and though you might not know it, if you listen close, they play a few different songs. The loudest one is used to lure female crickets, but once a female is near, they switch to a quieter courtship song. And there are songs that indicate to other males to stay away, or that they're about to fight. Pretty complex for a small little insect, right? Researchers have even done some studies with female crickets to determine what sounds and rhythms they prefer by tracking how they move relative to any given song. But there's even more here. Did you know that if you count the number of chirps in a cricket song over a 15 second period and add 40 to it, you will have an accurate measurement of the ambient temperature? This is referred to as Dolbeer's Law, after Amos Dolbeer, who realized in the 1800s that the rate of cricket chirps correlated with the outside temperature. This science at work here is that the male cricket's muscles move easier in warmer weather than they do in cold weather, so they can chirp faster when it's warm and are slower in the cold. If you don't believe me, go check out that link in the episode description. Cricket songs were also used in Old China to help predict when to plant and when to harvest, and this makes some sense when you consider the months that the crickets are active and the rate of chirping as it relates to temperature. And there's still more. I'm sure you've noticed that when you walk towards the sound of a cricket at night, or enter an area where the crickets are chirping, that they almost always stop. Well, they noticed this too, and the crickets were often used as a sort of proto-house alarm to warn of intruders or movement inside the house. There's another thing crickets do very well. Reproduce. In their short lifespan of about three months, a single female cricket can produce hundreds of eggs. One thing that was considered lucky, and still is in many ways, is fertility. But especially in old China, having more children was seen as a blessing and sign of good fortune and prosperity for the future, and the ability to do a lot of work in a very short time. So aside from the song that served as both entertainment and as a house alarm, crickets were a symbol of fertility and prosperity. As such beloved creatures, crickets found their place in many houses, and people would often have intricately carved cricket houses made out of gourds, or very carefully made cages, and they would adjust the interior of the cricket house to be warmer or cooler, depending on the season. So where might you place something so revered as a cricket in your home? A cricket on the hearth, perhaps? I'll post some pictures of these cricket houses over at lorenlegends.net, where you can check them out for yourself. The link, again, is in the episode description. But now we need to talk about the actual cricket fighting. Yeah, it turns out that's a thing. A big thing in some areas, and has been for a very long time. The sport of cricket fighting traces its roots back over a thousand years into the Chinese Tong Dynasty. Starting off as a sport for the affluent, it soon gained popularity among the common people as well. It lasted all the way until the rise of the Communist Party in China in the 1960s, who did what communists tend to do, and they made everything suck. Cricket fighting, which was part of Chinese culture going back centuries, was outlawed for being a sport of the bourgeois. It's making a great comeback in modern times, though, and late September is actually the official cricket fighting season. Organized cricket fighting tournaments are now common, and cricket fights are even broke up into weight classes, not so different from any other human fighting sport. A single cricket can be worth upwards of $50, and match wagers can often exceed $1,000, though gambling on the fights is still technically illegal and the gambling makes the gathering subject to police raids, but officially sanctioned tournaments are really all about competition, prestige, and honor. In 2010, it's estimated that some $63 million was spent on crickets alone in China. Now, of course, crickets have jaws to eat, 
but honestly, I didn't even know they could really bite like that. Most crickets can't bite hard enough to puncture human skin, but they can in fact bite pretty hard, apparently. Though they tend to only go after other insects. If you click that link in the episode description, there will be some pictures and videos and even a short documentary on cricket fights over at lorenlegends.net. But there's one more cricket thing I want to talk about before we're done. And that's crickets as food, and not for your pet reptile. Crickets, as we have learned, reproduce rapidly and in very large numbers. And they are also very high in protein. In some parts of the world, they are already eaten alongside other insects. But the trend is catching on as the human population grows, and we look for alternatives to industrial meat farming. You may have seen dried and seasoned crickets at a novelty shop at some point here in the U.S., but you may not know that a U.S. company called EXO makes protein bars and protein powder out of crickets. I'll have some links up at laurenlegends.net if you want to give one a try. Buying them will help the podcast even, and you'll get to feel super adventurous. There is also high-end survival shelter companies like Terraform, and they're relying on sustainable cricket farms built into the walls as a means to keep potential bunker dwellers' protein needs met while they wait out riots or the apocalypse. In a few years, the crickets as food market might well exceed $50 million domestically. That sounds crazy, right? Well, sushi and lobster weren't even popular as little as 100 years ago and were in fact seen as weird and not something you would want to eat. So, there you have it. The humble cricket chirping away outside your window actually does have quite the history with mankind. And as the legend goes, the louder he chirps, the more prosperity is headed your way. Be sure to check out that link in the episode description for sources to everything mentioned in this episode. And if you want to support the show, buy some of those cricket bars. Or, if you're less adventurous, but still feeling charitable, get me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash loreandlegends. Till next time.